Hello, my name is Sam Felton. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration. Now, before I hand over to Liz, uh, who will be taking you through the Real Food Lifestyle course, uh, I just wanted to mention that in addition to providing this course for free, we also run an online weekly lifestyle support group you can join as well. Uh, simply go to our website at www.phcuk.org forward slash support and you can sign up right there. Also on the website, you can find lots of free resources and projects that you can get involved in, such as Real Food Runners or even the Ambassadors Programme as well. Uh, and if you find any of our content valuable whatsoever, uh, please, please, please do consider donating what you can or even regularly contributing to the charity by becoming an annual member. Now, without further ado, let me hand you over to Liz. Hello again, and welcome back to this course on the Real Food Low Carb Lifestyle. Just a reminder that the information contained uh, within this course is just that. It's information and not medical advice. If you have any medical questions, you do need to speak with your GP or your nurse. In this session, a little bit more detail about how I became diabetic and why so many of us develop diabetes or struggle to lose weight. We will talk more about sugar and also the role of fats. Then we'll go on to think about some healthy ideas for lunch. As I said in the last session, I'm going to go back a little to explain how I got where I was when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. This was me about 12 years ago, not a very flattering picture. I weighed over 14 stone, 90 kilos, and was a UK size 20, 22. I'd been overweight my entire life, and at various times I'd dieted. I did a couple of rounds of Weight Watchers over the years, lost a stone or two, but then put it all back on again. I made other attempts too at losing weight, but about the time this photo was taken, I heard a couple of programs about diabetes and healthy eating and the role of low GI or glycemic index foods. And knowing I was at risk of developing type two because of my age and the fact that I was very overweight, I decided to try and eat more healthily. I made sure I got my five a day, became quite fanatical about it in fact, I swapped from long grain rice to basmati rice and ate wholemeal bread. I had jacket potatoes and beans and lentils, zero fat or low fat yogurts, margarine rather than butter, all the things we're told to do. In fact, it's what we're advised to eat by the NHS following their eat well plate. And if you're in other parts of the world, in the US or in Australia, the rules are very similar. The guidelines if you've ever been referred to a diabetes education course in the UK, you will almost certainly have been shown a copy of this. As you can see, we're advised to fill about a third of our plate with carbohydrates, which is what I did and what many of us do. In fact, it's what many of us find depressing, that despite our best efforts to follow the advice, we're still overweight and develop or still have type 2 diabetes. I didn't lose any weight doing this and making the changes. To be honest, as I got older, I worried less about that and decided there was no point in dieting because it always went back on anyway. But I felt reasonably fine. And with my five a day and the whole grains and the low GI, I thought I was eating more healthily, barring the odd pork pie, of course, and the occasional ice cream. I'm no saint. Um, but as we're told, everything in moderation. And you can even see some of these treats in the bottom left hand corner of the diagram. And I certainly didn't eat them every day. So why did I develop diabetes? I think it might be useful to understand what happens when we eat carbohydrates. Don't worry, I'm not going to try. I'm going to try and keep it simple. And as we discovered last week, when we eat food, the stomach converts the sugars and starches or carbohydrates into glucose, which then enter the bloodstream. And you can see that these are the little purple dots here. Left in the bloodstream, glucose is very harmful and causes damage to the blood vessels. So the pancreas produces insulin, which combines with the glucose. Here we've got the pancreas here sitting underneath the stomach, producing insulin, which then goes in and joins the glucose in the bloodstream. And this allows the glucose to enter the cells where we can use it for energy. However, if we've eaten more carbohydrates than we need at that moment and produced more glucose than we need, and because glucose is so damaging, the excess is taken to the liver where it's converted to fat and stored all over the body. The danger is, though, that if we go on eating high levels of carbohydrate, 
insulin can become less effective and we become what's called insulin resistant. The excess fat in the liver can affect insulin production, which can in turn lead to type 2 diabetes. However, high levels of glucose circulating in the blood, even in someone who doesn't develop diabetes, over time leads to cell damage, which in turn can lead to heart disease, kidney failure and dementia. What also happens when the insulin has rid the bloodstream of the excess glucose, which it does quite quickly because, as we've said, glucose in the bloodstream is toxic. Think of it as an army of mini Brillo pads rubbing away at the lining of your arteries is that the brain then releases a hormone called ghrelin, known as the hunger hormone, encouraging you to eat again because there now there's no more glucose left where it's needed. And so the cycle goes on. This is why when you've had cereal and toast for breakfast, in no time at all, your body wants something else and you reach for the biscuits or a Kit Kat or a banana, whatever it is. I wonder if you know how much glucose there should be in your bloodstream at any one time. Bearing in mind that your body has eight to 10 pints of blood, which is quite a lot, um, how much do you think there should be? Well, the answer is one teaspoonful or about five grams. However, the good news is that your body can burn fat for energy instead of glucose. And in addition, when you do need glucose, your body can make all you need by a process called gluconeogenesis, which happens in the liver using mainly fats and proteins from the foods you've eaten. So once you cut out all the processed carbs and eat real nutrient dense foods, for instance, your bacon and eggs or your full fat yogurt and nuts, you won't be craving something else five minutes later because when your body has used the fat from your breakfast, instead of sending out the ghrelin and making you feel hungry again, it simply turns to burning your own body fat instead. And you start to use those reserves so you lose weight without feeling hungry. It can take a period of time to adapt, anything between one and six months, depending on the individual and the rate at which they cut carbohydrates. And of course, we do snack out of habit too, and from boredom, but you shouldn't be hungry. And in time, you should find it easier to resist snacking. Also, being busy is good. So give yourself something to do. Go out for a walk, um, do the laundry, clean the house, do whatever. Distract yourself and you won't think of food so much. Going back a moment to my own diagnosis, the doctor agreed I was eating a healthy diet. After all, I was pretty much following the NHS guidelines. And so she prescribed metformin, which is the usual first step in treating diabetes. But I had heard about remission. And after a bit of research and remembering a TV program I'd seen, I decided to try Michael Mosley's eight week blood sugar diet. This is 800 calories a day for eight weeks, which sounded a bit drastic. But I decided that if it was only for eight weeks and it would get rid of my diabetes, then I would do it come what may. However, although it's calorie restricted, it's essentially low carbs. So it's the carbs that are being cut out, not to a large extent, the fats. And quite amazingly, I found I wasn't hungry, although I was only having about 150 calories for breakfast, a slice of ham and a fried egg and some mushrooms, for example. I found that kept me going till lunchtime without too much difficulty. And the weight dropped off. After two months, I'd lost two stone, more than I'd ever dreamed possible. This progress spurred me on, and in three months, I'd lost three stone. I'd also put my diabetes in remission with an HbA1c of 35. We'll look at the numbers in just a moment. So at that point, I upped my calories gradually until I was eating a normal amount, and I continued to lose another stone. If any of you would like to do this, follow the Michael Mosley diet. You can, of course. But I now know that you can lose weight and put type 2 diabetes in remission without this drastic calorie restriction. If you struggle to lose weight as you go through the course, then we can look at what might be slowing the weight loss. There are many reasons and often making small changes can make a big difference. Remember, too, that you may change shape and lose inches before the scales see any appreciable difference. We're all different and patterns of weight loss can vary enormously. I mentioned HbA1c. There are various diagnostic tests for diabetes, but this is the one most commonly used. We're looking at the figures in the yellow box. Anything under 42 is non-diabetic. 43 to 47 is pre-diabetic. And if you continue to eat high levels of carbohydrate, it's probably only a matter of time before that creeps up. 
And then anything over 47 is full-blown type 2 diabetes. With a low-carb lifestyle, of course, comes the need to eat more fat. And I think this might be a good moment to listen to this presentation by Zoe Harkham. Zoe has a PhD in nutritional science and is a leading international expert in the field. A couple of years ago, she was one of a number of people from the PHC who spoke to the Parliamentary Committee for Diabetes at the House of Commons, and she explained why the guidelines are wrong and what needs to change. It's only about 10 minutes long, and so I think we'll listen to it now. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming this evening to listen to us. Um, I always put a lot of academic references behind my slides. They're on my website, forward slash APPG. I will also put up these slides over the next 24 hours because I do appreciate at the back, they may be quite difficult to see, although you'll be pleased to know there are pictures and not words. We seem to have forgotten why we eat. And we eat because there are certain things that we must consume. Otherwise, we get seriously sick, if not die. And we need to eat things that we know as macronutrients and micronutrients. Now, the macronutrients we know as carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And there are essential fats and there are essential proteins. And in nutrition, the word essential means something that we must consume. The body doesn't make it. There is no essential carbohydrate. This is a statement from an American public body, the Panel on Macronutrients, the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate is apparently zero, provided that enough fat and protein are consumed. That is not a contentious statement. That is a nutritional fact. Micronutrients we know as vitamins and minerals. There are 13 vitamins that we must consume and approximately 16 min minerals likewise. Another interesting nutritional fact is that protein tends to be approximately 15% of any natural diet. So you might then think that a balanced diet would have fat and carbohydrate making up the rest of the pie, excuse the pun. But of course, we put in a requirement that we should have no more than 30% of our calorie intake in the form of total fat. And the minute you set that restriction, you have by definition made the pie to make up of 55% carbohydrate. And in case that wasn't worked out, that statement there, increase your carbohydrate consumption to at least 55 to 60% of your calorie intake, that was a mandate in the 1977 American guidelines set by Senator George McGovern. So this was the focus of my PhD. I spent four years studying at PhD level and many years before that, fascinated by why we would set that restriction. And we set it in the name of heart disease. We believe that dietary fat caused heart disease. We still do believe that dietary fat causes heart disease. I wanted to look at the evidence base for that claim. It also made no sense to me that dietary fat would cause heart disease. Because if you go back to why we eat, why would Mother Nature put the essential fats, the complete proteins, and all the vitamins and minerals in the same food that is then trying to kill us? It just makes no sense. So why do we have so much carbohydrate? Because we demonized fat. As some of you may remember these headlines from February 2015, The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Mail, we've got the dietary fat guidelines wrong. They shouldn't have been introduced. Butter is not bad for us after all. It reached Time Magazine, Sydney Morning Herald, and New Zealand. And all of those headlines came from the first major paper from my PhD. And it essentially said, if you look at the evidence pyramid, at the top of the evidence pyramid, you have what's called a systematic review, no cherry picking, you go through all the evidence, and you pull it together in a technique called meta-analysis. And the best trials that you can do that to are randomized controlled trials. So that was the absolute best evidence available. And the unique aspect of that paper was that it went back to when the dietary guidelines were set in 1977 in the US, in 1983 in the UK. And it said, if we had that technique of meta-analysis now, what would the evidence have shown? And the evidence showed that there was no difference whatsoever between putting people on any dietary fat intervention that you could choose and any impact on all-cause mortality or coronary heart disease mortality. 
The other secondary finding from that paper, which is why I think it caught the attention of the world, was that those trials combined, there were only six trials, and they involved fewer than 2,500 sick men, men who had already had a heart attack. No women were studied, no healthy people were studied, and yet we changed dietary guidelines for 300 million Americans. That became the 64th most impactful paper of 2015 in any discipline, whether that's global warming, education or whatever. That is how interested people are in nutrition, and that is how much they want us to get it right. So the first paper you've just seen, I was pleasantly surprised, the speed at which Public Health England said, OK, the evidence wasn't there at the time, but the evidence is there now. Well, that surprised me because the second paper from our team was ready to go and it brought the evidence up to date. And it said, OK, we're not now back in 1983. We're here in 2016. What does all the available evidence today show? And similarly, it showed that there was no evidence whatsoever for introducing those guidelines. The completeness. Population studies, as Asima said, are not as powerful as evidence. But for completeness, let's look at the population studies to see what they say. No evidence at the time, no evidence today. So if you want to read one of the papers on the reference slides, that's the one. It's basically my PhD in one paper on open view. And it concludes that there was simply no evidence at the time or now to introduce those two dietary fat guidelines. Now, you don't just have to take my word for it, because that final paper, as it should do, looked at the other researchers who had looked at exactly the same topic. And there were 17, and we were just one of those. And they'd been going since about 2009. And across those 17, there were 40 separate findings where they'd looked at either mortality or cardiovascular disease or events, the total fat, saturated fat, swapping one fat for another fat, 40 different findings from those seven teams, only three found anything against any fat. Now, why is it not being screamed from the rooftops that 37 results from seven independent teams found nothing? We need to stop demonizing fat. Of the three findings, one was against trans fats. You'll get no argument from me on that one, ban them. Two were from the same team. They essentially went back to revisit their own results. It was the Hooper team. They found an association between cardiovascular disease events and saturated fat intake, swapping it for unsaturated fat intake. And I'm indebted to Trudy. I always credit Dr. Trudy Deacon for this one. Trudy managed to sift through the 200 odd page paper and to realize when that was subjected to a sensitivity test, even those findings, those two repeated findings, fell away. So there is nothing against total or saturated fat and nothing for any of those conditions, mortality, coronary heart disease, myocardial infarctions, that's heart attacks, strokes, non-fatal heart attacks, nothing for any of them. So you would think, would you not, that when the, I have to call this the eat badly guide or the, put it in inverted commas at least, because this is so not the way to eat healthily. When this was reintroduced, it was the eat badly place, it became the eat badly guide in March 2016. You would think that Public Health England would have moved dramatically away from demonizing fat. And then, of course, you would be wrong because they put together these sections of their new plate. And I like to think I've analyzed this plate more than anyone else in the UK. If you know anyone who's done it more than me, let me know because I want to shake their hand. But what happens, this is all by portion size on the plate. So it's by volume, it's by weight. And when you assign a calorie intake to it, because these approximate to 400 calories per 100 grams, these are tiny, nearer 50, this ends up being 62% of your calorie intake. The vegetables and fruits, just 8%. Dairy, how essential for bones, calcium, and so on, just 6%. The most healthy section on the whole plate where there's a little bit of meat, but they try not to emphasize it, 11%. Junk, you can't take junk off the plate, surely, 9%. And then you've got the fats and spreads, 4%. And they published some menus at the time. So I went through all of those menus in great detail. And I found that the plate had moved even further from those macronutrients of 15, 30, and 55. Protein was at about 19%. Fat was at about 16%. And carb had become 
On average, it costs men is 65% of your calorie intake. Some days the carb intake was as high as 70% of the diet, 375 grams of carbohydrate a day. Unsurprisingly, that diet is nutritionally deficient. Particularly in the fat-soluble vitamins, because you're just not eating fat. So it's deficient in retinol, a quarter of what we need. Vitamin D, a quarter of what we need. Also deficient in vitamin E and calcium. And the EAT diet that was published earlier on this year, within two hours of opening the paper, I published a blog showing that it was deficient again in the fat-soluble vitamins, iron, calcium, and the essential fatty acids. So diabetes, if you sum up diabetes in one sentence, either type, it is the inability to handle carbohydrate. It's basically the body saying, you've had too much carbohydrate too often, I just can't cope with getting it out of the bloodstream any longer. So the Public Health England advice is essentially a recipe for diabetes. And why might that be? Well, would it surprise you to know that those organizations are just a tiny few of the organizations represented by the people on the panel? Public Health England put together the panel that was going to design that Eat Badly guide. There were 11 reps, only nine turned up regularly. Only one of those had no conflicts of interest. Five were representatives of these organizations. So those companies at the back there are just some of the members of one of those organizations, the British Nutrition Foundation. We don't have all the others from the British Retail Consortium Institute of Grocery Distribution and so on. My final slide, people here sat before you today, and I think we can probably speak on behalf of Tom as well. We're asking for three things. We're saying, please don't base the guidelines on the one macronutrient that we don't need and the one macronutrient that diabetics can't handle. Please don't allow the fake food industry to set our guidelines. As Professor Catesby says, it's like putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank. And please give patients choice. There are three evidence-based ways. Remember the final slide, the evidence is on that slide. Three evidence-based ways to reverse or put it into remission. Bariatric surgery, unfortunately, is one of them. Low-calorie diets are another, and low-carb diets are another. And give patients at least the choice between the two dietary options, even if you don't want to offer them bariatric surgery. Thank you for listening. So... As you've heard, there's no scientific evidence to indicate that eating saturated fat has anything to do with heart disease. In fact, the biggest risk factors are obesity and insulin resistance. If you're diabetic, you're three times more likely to have a heart attack than anyone else. And looking at it the other way, half the people who have a heart attack have perfectly normal cholesterol levels. So cholesterol has no direct correlation. It is implicated, but only because of the damage caused by overconsumption of carbohydrates and vegetable oils, which create inflammation in the blood vessels, which the cholesterol then tries to resolve by creating a smooth lining to the blood vessels, which then in turn becomes calcified and causes problems. But if you didn't have the damage caused by the glucose in the first place, then you wouldn't have a problem with the cholesterol. I don't know if you also um, took in what Zoe said about vitamins as well. Eating excess carbohydrates and limiting fats leaves you deficient in things like vitamin D. And if you followed some of the data coming out about COVID-19, for example, all those who had serious side effects from catching the virus had low vitamin D. And this is probably because vitamin D plays a very important part in creating a healthy immune system. A quick look at this chart will show us that if we eat healthy, low carb diet, rich in fish, eggs, butter, etc., we'll get all the vitamin A we need because along with the vitamin is fat, which allows the body to absorb it. If, however, we're on a low fat diet and eating loads of veg like tomatoes, carrots, etc., without eating the fatty meat or fish with them, then although the vitamins are in the vegetables, your body can't access them and they'll pass through you. So although you may think you're eating plenty of vitamins, you aren't and you're not getting the benefit from them. So cook your peppers in plenty of oil, fry your greens in butter so you can access the vitamins. Or, of course, eat your vegetables with fatty meat or oily fish or avocados, nuts, etc. Um, that way you'll get the benefit of the vitamins. So now let's talk about lunch. First of all, let's think about what many of us usually eat for lunch. Sandwiches, crisps, crackers with cheese, a takeaway. Lunch is different for different people. 
Are you at home, for example, during the day and therefore eating at home? Or do you have to eat at work, so therefore need to take something with you? If you're at home, it's simpler. You can cook something quick. For instance, chop a couple of rashers of streaky bacon, fry them until the fat starts to render and the bacon starts to go crispy, add some sliced cabbage and fry gently. When it's softened a little, move to one side and fry a couple of eggs. Serve the eggs on top of the fried cabbage and bacon. It's delicious. Equally, you can simply assemble an assortment of things from the fridge. Some cold meat or tinned fish, a piece of cheese, smoked mackerel fillets or cooked chicken perhaps, or reheat yesterday's leftovers. Add a salad, a few slices of avocado maybe, a couple of baby tomatoes, and you're done. Or you can make a soup. There are many, any number of recipes online for low-carb soups. Do beware of ready-made commercial soups, though, whether they're tinned or in the fresh um, aisles, because they all contain processed vegetables. I have yet to find a commercially available soup that does not contain vegetable oils. Um, So if you find one, do let us know. Um, However, if you need to take lunch to work um, or when you're out and about, it may need a bit more planning. There are several bread recipes in our recipe folder. A flaxseed roll stuffed with cheddar cheese is really filling. Remember that these low carb breads are really nutrient dense and much more filling than regular bread, which is just empty calories with little nutritional value. Any of these breads can be cooked in batches and they freeze so you can take out as needed. I usually make them in the form of rolls, but you can make the same recipe as a loaf of bread. Once it's cooled, slice it and then freeze it. So you take out as much or as little as you want, whenever you want. We really like the almond chia bread that's in the resources folder. These are really convenient to take out for the day. And if you butter them and stuff them with cheddar cheese, including three or four baby tomatoes with it and a couple of squares of very dark chocolate, you won't even need to take a cool bag with you. Cloud bread's a favourite with lots of people too. Again, the recipe's in the recipe folder. You can put anything in the rolls or have them with homemade soups, which you can take in a thermos. A homemade coleslaw is one idea. You can make enough for two or three days and store it in the fridge. Put a portion in a container you can take to work. Add some grated cheese on top and a few chopped nuts as well. And mix them only when you come to eat it. Instead of using mayonnaise, most of which are made from vegetable oils, which we need to avoid. Though remember, you can buy avocado mayonnaise or make your own using avocado oil. We've given you a recipe which uses full fat Greek yogurt as an alternative. Simply add lemon juice and maybe a little bit of Dijon or other mustard, and it makes a perfectly acceptable dressing for a coleslaw. Another idea is to make crustless quiches. We've given you a couple of recipes, but you can use any quiche recipe. Just leave out the pastry and cook them directly in the dish. Or for lunches, make them in muffin tins. You can make them in batches and once cooked, you can freeze them and take them out as needed. Two or three of those for lunch is an excellent idea. They're easy to take in a lunchbox and you could also add some salad items, baby tomatoes, a chunk of cucumber, some radishes, half an avocado, a few walnuts. There are lots of other options too. Meatballs are delicious cold and again can be batch cooked and frozen. We've given you a recipe for orange cake too, for example. We make it in a square earthenware dish and then cut into squares and freeze. Again, remember that low carb cakes are often much denser and more filling than regular cakes. So one small square is all you need. And again, they freeze. So just take one out per day as you need it. If you want to add a dollop of uh, thick cream or full fat yogurt, go ahead, that's fine. But sometimes we're in a rush and just don't have time to prepare anything. And the high street is usually full of burgers or sandwiches and wraps. But there's usually a grocery store of some sort around, a Tesco local and M&S food or different um, companies where you are. So pop in there and grab some cheese or ready cooked chicken. M&S and other stores do wonderful rollitos with Serrano ham and Manchego cheese. They also do a couple of variations with Parma ham and Carrizzo, but those have a few more carbs in them. Nothing particularly high, but always check your labels and go for the lower carb version if you can. You could also pick up a small tub of plain Greek yogurt to finish off if you wanted to. Even have some dark chocolate over 85%. Don't eat the whole bar, though. Take a couple of squares and you can always take the rest home and bring it in another day. As I mentioned oils in regard to mayonnaise and ready-made soups, 
I just wanted to show you this diagram, which shows how vegetable oils are produced. I'll be going into more detail in a later session about the damage caused by vegetable oils. And there are a couple of links in the resources to more information about the harm they can cause. So if you want more detail, look those up. But here you can see they undergo cleansing with detergents. Then they're mixed with solvents such as hexane and heated to high temperatures. This heating causes oxidation. In other words, they go rancid. They're then further treated with various alkalis put through a centrifuge before being rinsed with soapy water. They then undergo deodorizing to remove the rancid smell that was created when they heated them to a high temperature. And they then bleach them to make them look lovely and golden rather than something that resembles machine oil. And remember that margarine or spreads like flora and benicol or the spreadable butters are simply vegetable oils that have gone through even more processing to create a solid. The longer article in the paperwork explains the history of these oils and how they came to be sold for human consumption, having been previously used as engine oil. Commercial interests at their very worst, perhaps. So make sure you're using extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil and proper butter in a block, not margarine or spreadable butter. To sum up today, we've looked again at how sugar affects our blood glucose levels and why increased blood sugar is bad for our health. We've looked at healthy lunch options and had a quick look at vegetable oils. Next time, we'll look at blood glucose monitors and how they can help us determine which foods suit us best. We'll also look at food packaging and how to shop wisely. And remember that if you want to join others in our support group, which includes live Zoom sessions and an active Facebook group, you can find details of how to register for those on the PHC website. So now, until next week, thank you for being here and I'll see you in the next session. Goodbye. Thank you.